It's called the Highway to Hell, a scary 50-mile stretch between Houston and Galveston, Texas, littered with mystery and misery. It cuts through a mix of murky swamps, old farms, and abandoned oil fields, making it the perfect dumping ground for dead bodies. 30 women have disappeared along this lonely highway, some found in shallow graves near a place locals call the Texas Killing Field. They are mostly young, pretty, and brunette. For years, police have wondered if it's the work of one sadistic serial killer or a handful of evil copycats. Jan Bynum keeps a yellow ribbon in the front yard of her home in Farmer's Branch, Texas. Her daughter, Kelly Cox, is one of the missing. I always i have said for years, I will not give up hope until there is absolute proof that she's gone, that she's dead. I, I won't. Kelly, a young single mom who just happened to be a pretty brunette. She was a pretty, pretty amazing young lady. She was very focused, had a plan. Kelly spent her morning studying at the University of North Texas and the rest of her days being mom to daughter Alexis. Having a child that young is not ideal, but she didn't let that stop her. July 15th started like any other for Kelly. It was a school day. Her uncle snapped this picture of Kelly and Alexis moments before they raced out the door. I said, well, I love you, honey. Have a good day. I'll talk to you this afternoon. Those were my last words. Kelly dropped 19-month-old Alexis at a babysitter's, then drove to Denton Prison for a field trip with her criminology class. Her professor told the students not to bring phones, keys, or personal items to the prison. He said, you know, get a ride over here, take a cab, you know, use a hide key And she used the hide key According to Kelly's boyfriend, Lawrence Harris III, he and Kelly had a spare key made. They tested it the night before the tour to make sure it worked and then hid the little magnetic box in the wheel well of her beige 240SX. She locked everything in her trunk and then went on the tour. After the tour, Kelly heads back to her car. And that's when Officer Shane Kaiser says the story takes a bizarre turn. She would have walked down the sidewalk on the south end of the building and come to this parking lot that's behind us where her car was parked at the time. She was unable to get her car unlocked. That spare car key that had worked just hours before now mysteriously would not open Kelly's car. She ended up coming back across the street. She came to this business here, which at the time was Rick's drive-in. She went in and got changed, came back out and used the payphone. Kelly calls her boyfriend Lawrence for help. His exact words were, she called and she said, the key won't work. Can you bring me another key and help me get into my car? And so that's what he was doing. Lawrence claims he drives straight to the prison. And when he arrives 35 minutes later, Kelly's car is in the parking lot, but she's nowhere to be found. It just didn't make any sense. It'd be like Martians came down and just picked her up, poofed her away. Because people remember her at the payphone and that's the last anybody remembers seeing her. By 5.30 that afternoon, Kelly's mom's heart is pounding. I knew absolutely, without a doubt, that there was something wrong because that's, that's when she had to pick Alexis up at the babysitter. Police begin questioning those closest to Kelly. We're going to look at anyone that, that she may be seeing, any close friends that she spends time with, and uh, her boyfriend was one of those. But Lawrence passes four polygraph tests, and police eliminate him as a suspect. Now, with no leads, no witnesses, no surveillance video, the case goes cold. Then a possible break. Cops get a tip that this man, William Reese, a convicted sex offender, had just been released from prison. A credit card receipt from a gas station put the trucker in Denton the day Kelly disappeared. But the hot tip quickly goes cold. They didn't find any evidence of her fingerprints in his truck, so basically that was the extent of looking at William Reese. For years, Jan's heart would sink every time a body was discovered in that Texas killing field, or even when a kidnapped victim like Elizabeth Smart returned home. Every single day you ask that question, is today the day 
that she's gonna come through the door, she's gonna call on the phone, or the police department's gonna call, and we have answers. But the hardest part for Jan was explaining to little Alexis that her mommy is lost. She drew pictures of, of Kelly. And she said, Anna, here's pictures. I drew pictures for posters to go up on in the park to look for mommy. And it was, I mean, when I look at those pictures, it just brings tears to my eyes. I would just tell her I love her and I miss her. Then, finally, this February, almost 19 years after Kelly disappeared, police finally make that terrible call to Jan, and a familiar face comes back to haunt her. He said, yes, it is, you know, William Reese who we're looking at. Yes, the same William Reese cops originally suspected all those years ago. He's serving 60 years in a Texas prison for kidnapping a woman. DNA has just linked him to another murder in Oklahoma. Reese's attorney, Anthony Osso, says his client doesn't want to face the death penalty and offers to tell cops where he buried the bodies of two missing young women, Jessica Kane and Kelly Cox, if they agree not to execute him. You've had those times over 19 years where something seemed positive and then ends up leading to nothing, and so then you're kind of let down. And so I think, with especially with our investigators, they went with a cautious uh, but optimistic approach. Reese leads investigators to an area not far from the highway to hell, where they do find Jessica Kane's body. And then, Reese takes police to an old farm nearby where he says he buried Kelly. I've always been asked, well, do you hope those are her remains? If she's gone and those are her remains, I want them to find them and I want them to identify them. In a shallow grave, they find Kelly. My hope was completely taken away when they found remains where Mr. Reese said they would and they came back with the dental and said, it's Kelly. There's no doubt it's Kelly. Jan finally had her answer. I can be comforted that I know she's in God's arms and I can bring her home and put her to rest the way I want to. Jan and her husband Niles later adopted Alexis. The cute toddler Kelly left behind is now a young woman. As for that yellow ribbon, Jan is keeping it up, hoping the other girls out there in the Texas fields make it home too. And I miss her a lot. I also know I was blessed with 20 years with her. And thank God for that.